Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old podcast we are taking a look, right, at, at some plots, some schemes that uh, some folks cooked up and that meal, <laughs> it was pretty rancid, uh, let me tell you that much. No, this is a this is a two-parter episode of the podcast. Each one, each part is just as wild, though, as the other. See, in part one, right, get a load of this. I got a story that goes from New York to Texas. And in part two, we are staying firmly in New York City to see if a bathtub incident was really, was really just all that. Water sports involved? Question mark? So, look forward to that one. In fact, why do I say look forward to it when we can just kind of get straight into it. You know, like, let's not beat around the bush, I say, as I'm beating around the bush. But I kind of just want to spend more time talking with you. So, you know, you're doing. Me? I'm doing all right. You know, busy cooking up some whopper new episodes of the podcast and videos for you. I mean, I hope so. F- flame grilled, uh, at least. And finally, before I get into it, if I could ask you to please rate and review the podcast, that helps out so incredibly much. Um, if you if you do that, I promise, I promise, I will call you when you're home alone and ask you what's your favorite scary movie. So, so fingers crossed on that one. Now, let's give it a go. In 2018, in the town of Sodus, beautiful upstate New York, lived Josh Niles and his girlfriend, Amber Washburn. Sodus, drinking soda and sodas, it's it's a village of around 10,000 people. It's sitting on one of the Great Lakes, well, I mean, come on, let's be honest here, pretty good lakes, I'd say, Lake Ontario. So, Josh and Amber, let's talk about them. Sure, why not? Josh, he was 28 years old, a native upstate New Yorker. Amber, the very same, a local, and she was four years his junior. She was 24 years old. Now, Josh and Amber, together, they had a son, Joshua Jr. And Josh himself, he had two children from a previous relationship, which had been about a decade before. See, Josh Niles, he had previously been with a woman named Charlene Childers. She, too, an upstate New Yorker. What are the odds? The story I'm telling you is set, you know, that's set in upstate New York or revolves around upstate New Yorkers? This is mad stuff. However, you know, in the years since that relationship, when it fell apart and Josh, he started seeing Amber, Amber would become close with, you know, the, the two children from the Childers relationship. Amber would become a mother to them. See, what happened was that Charlene Childers, she moved to Sunray, Texas in 2013. The two children she had with Josh, they wouldn't stay with her in Texas for too long. Josh and Amber would get custody of those two children. So, living in upstate New York in Sodus with three kids. See, Charlene, she lived with her husband, a guy named Tim Dean, a police chief down in Sunray. That's in the panhandle of Texas. What happened? The reason why Charlene didn't have her two kids anymore, they were taken from Texas to New York, was that Tim Dean was charged with felony child abuse. What a legend. Jeez. In the May of 2018. And so the judge granted Josh Niles full custody of the two kids. They went to New York full time with their dad and his new girl, Amber. Tim Dean swiftly resigned as police chief. Hmm. Now, okay, you know, that's that's like the short and sweet version of events for now. And that more or less takes us to late October in 2018. On the 22nd of October 2018, after 2 p.m., shortly after 2 p.m., Josh was pulling into his driveway in Sodus. It was an autumnal day. He was surrounded by grey clouds, orange trees, and pumpkins. As he pulled into his driveway, he saw someone sitting on the bench outside his house. Josh parked up, popped out of his truck, and then started yapping away with this lad, leaning on his truck, shooting the shit. Now, a neighbor saw Josh out of their window as all this was happening, saw him leaning against his truck in the driveway in deep conversation with some guy who was a stranger to them. It looked like they they knew each other, and then this, this neighbor saw Amber pull in too. She was she was arriving around the same time home. Then the neighbor went back to doing whatever they were doing. This was followed swiftly by gunshots that fall afternoon. 
And as the neighbor looked out her window once again, in shock, she saw Josh clutching his chest. And then Amber reversing out of the driveway, tires and engine squealing, and the gunman turning. Josh was falling to the ground and screaming out Amber's name. Then the gunman shot her multiple times through the windshield as her car rolled onto the street. As this neighbor ducked into their home, she heard more gunshots ring out that misty ball day. 911 were called and the police, they arrived within minutes. Josh was found lying dead next to his truck. Amber, her car having rolled down the driveway, coming to a rest in the neighbor's yard across the street. And she was lying over the center console in her car. Her four-year-old son, Joshua Jr., was in the back seat, still holding onto his chicken nuggets from McDonald's, in shock. The neighbors gathered round and immediately began to tell the police that they had seen the shooter, wearing black, with a green hat, haul an ass from the house, through the backyards and over white picket fences, disappearing somewhere in that neighborhood. Police backup it wasn't far away, backup consisting of SWAT, helicopters, armed patrols. You didn't see anybody run through here at all? The nearby school, it was shut down, and the police, they started going door to door looking for whoever did this. What's up, it's K9. If anybody's inside, speak up now, you will get bit. With dogs and shoppers, it was a full-on manhunt. Residents, they were told to get inside their homes in this, in this lovely, leafy neighborhood. There was a killer on the loose. I saw the person shooting the, the guy underneath the truck. The person was stabbing the gun at him, and I could see his body jerk. And in turn, shot the girl in the car. Boom, boom, boom. And next thing I know, the car come run, rolling out and then took off running. I think they knew the person. The search, it went on for hours but was ultimately unsuccessful when the dogs led, led, led the police to a parking lot and the scent it, it came to an end. Whoever did this was long gone. However, one thing the police did find was a discarded Under Armour ski mask found by the dogs. Seemed pretty clear that this has been used by the killer, especially when some neighborhood uh, surveillance caught the guy. Now, this was from before the shooting, and it seemed like they had just been surveilling the area, walking up and down the street. But this character, they had a hood on, they were dressed all in black. It was, it was, it was impossible to identify who this was, pacing the sidewalk near the scene of the crime. Police then began informing the families. And they contacted Charlene to let her know about what had happened to the father and guardian of her two children. As I said, she was all the way down in Texas, but she already knew, as she said she had seen it on Facebook, the address where, where the murder had happened. Her two kids were fine, they were in school, while poor Josh Jr. witnessed the entire thing. Charlene immediately started driving from Texas. The most I have to say to y'all is justice needs to be served. My kids need that closure. Whoever did it has now made it to where my kids grew up that day. And that's nothing a kid should ever have to do. So who would want a young couple dead, 20, 28 years old, 24 years old, with three children to take care of? Amber, she was a baker. Josh, she was starting up a lawn care business. And he, he was thinking of popping the question to Amber. It seemed that from the number of shell casings, Josh himself was shot 10 times. And the fact that the neighbor had seen Josh talking to a guy, you know, it, it could have been a personal attack. Maybe Josh knew the shooter. Someone who wanted to be absolutely, positively sure he would not be getting up again. Speaking to the families, well, nothing. They were exactly who they kind of seemed to be. No enemies, you know, no nothing. Then they spoke to Charlene Childers, though. She had another version of Josh Niles to tell the police. Now, she, she had no clue who would do this, but she said, Josh Niles, listen up, guys, he's an abusive piece of shit. He loved drugs. There were some police reports to back it up. Minor stuff now, but, but they still did exist. And she said it was all that. It was Josh himself. That's what led her to go away. That was, that's what led her to run, essentially, all the way to T-Axis. She was running from Josh, according to her. 
Though Josh's family, you know, they would kind of dispute this, you know, two sides to every story, that Charlene could give as good as she got. And they themselves, the Niles family, were very relieved when she got out of New York, away from Josh, and eventually away from her own children. But still, an investigation needed to get going. Because of the relationship between Josh and Charlene, the police were interested in her, but she was confirmed to be in Texas at the time of the murders, and had arrived in New York to be with her children and, and mourn Josh. So what did the police know about hmm, Charlene? Well, down in Texas, she was in a relationship with our <laughs> child-abusing, piece-of-shit former chief of police, Timothy Dean. Charlene and Tim had met while she was working in the Dumas Police Department. Charlene worked in animal control. Tim was a sergeant. Tim would eventually become the Sunray Chief of Police, which sounds, sounds better than it actually was. He was the chief to two other officers, so a big, big whoop over here. Mr. Big Balls. As you can see, they give Tim Dean the important jobs. Anyways, Tim and Charlene, they got married in March 2018, and her Instagram showed what a great life they had together down in Texas. You know, she'd post pictures of them with their big old family. Tim, he had, a, he had a child of his own from a previous relationship. Tim with his short beard and his cowboy hat, because I believe it's legally mandatory to wear one if you live in Texas, apparently. Charlene with her glasses, and yeah, on her Instagram, lots of pictures of them smiling, laughing, family pictures, proposals, guns, and guitars. So, they were, they were happy down there. If, if you believe what people post on Instagram, of course. See, the story of Tim getting charged with child abuse goes a little something like this. Tim, he had a child from a previous marriage. The child lived with Tim and Charlene, and her name was Madison. Madison was three years old. And in May 2018, when Madison, one day she just wouldn't eat her food. Wow, a three-year-old won't eat her food. What are the odds? Tim, he got in her face and he started shouting at her and smacking her across the face. This was filmed by Charlene. And Charlene shared the video with some friends on Facebook. That video, it eventually made its way to Madison's mother, who got the police involved. Now, why the fuck she posted that on, on, on Facebook, on social media? I have no idea what was going through her mouse on a wheel, she calls a brain. Because when she posted it, it wasn't like, oh shit, you know, look at this dickhead hitting a kid. It was more of like, y'all, this is how we discipline our ha- Wait, no, she's from New York, so she wouldn't have had that accent. But you know what I mean, you know? She was like, listen, you know, she deserved it, that kind of shit. Great stuff. I wonder if there's some car kind, of, kind of correlation between being shitty enough to smack a child in the face and being stupid enough to upload it to social media. Hmm. Like, like she, she posted a video not to expose her husband, Tim. No, she did it to show her friends how awful Madison, her stepdaughter, was. She was saying in the video she shouldn't have married Tim because of this kid. Because she wouldn't eat her food. Tim was arrested and he was charged with a felony, third degree injury to a child, and five days later, he got a letter asking for his resignation, signed by both the mayor and the city manager. He was out in his arse. Tim Dean, he eventually got a job as a driver for Frito Lay. And, you know, word began to spread around town that he was looking for vengeance for his firing. I'm not wrong. It's the people who fired me for being a dick who are wrong. He was probably getting, like, the ultimate vengeance, though, while driving around these, you know, chips, smushing them up in the bag, you know, so that people will get them and they'll be all crushed up. It's cruel, man. So, this is what led to Josh and Amber getting the two children full-time just a few months before they were both murdered. And Madison, Tim's daughter by another woman, she was taken back by her mother, who, you know, Madison told her mother over time. It wasn't the first time that Tim had been hitting her, just the first time it had been recorded. So, Tim and Charlene, <laughs> uh, not great now, to be honest. In the August before the murders, which were in October, Charlene came up to New York to fight in court to get her children back. The judge ruled, however, that the kids would stay with Josh and Amber. You know, uh, maybe, maybe posting a video of your husband committing child abuse, not exactly uh, a ringing endorsement for mother of the year. She told that she would divorce him. Listen, I'll, I'll divorce that child abuser if I can get my kids back. No dice. Not for now, anyway. 
And so the investigation had quickly switched from upstate New York to Texas, as Charlene and former police chief Tim Dean were going under the microscope. After all, Tim, he had lost his job, he had lost his kid, and now Charlene had lost her kids. And now it seemed like Tim might be getting a divorce, losing the house too, and the lovely life, it was down the toilet. But their Instagram looks so good! Tim was, well, a guy with nothing to lose, and maybe a reason he might have gone to New York to do something drastic. Kill the father of Charlene's kids, she then gets her kids back, they stay married. And so, the police, they got a warrant for Tim Dean's phone records, and they showed that two days before the killings, interestingly enough, he had been in Emporia, Kansas, and there he had placed a 911 call. If you were driving from Sunray, Texas to Solis, New York, you'd probably pass through Emporia, Kansas. See, it turned out that in Kansas, uh, Tim, he had been in some kind of traffic accident after trying to do a Yui, you know, on the road, he, he'd accidentally run off it, and his car was now banjaxed. What happened? Well, I'm trying to turn around. Okay, got your license and paperwork for this thing. It's gonna be fine. It's a damn rental car. Mm -hmm. Got your yeah. rental agreement. Yeah. Jim, jump in here with me real quick. Jump in the front passenger seat. Can you try yeah, to turn around? Try to turn around right here, and it. So you just made a big flip around. Yeah. And we don't really do that around here, as you see why. Yeah. Who's Bowler Brown? He's a buddy of mine. Yeah, well, that's going to cause you more problems than anything. So he rented the car for you? Yeah, because I was stuck at work. I wasn't going to make it in time. I'm not looking forward to that phone call. That'll bite him in the ass pretty big. Honestly, man, I was just driving. My whole life has kind of gone lately. More or less living out of my car. But you had money to get a rental? Yeah, I still work. Just off this weekend. You didn't want to take your car? My car, the starter's acting up on it. Oh, uh, so you're just driving around Kansas from Texas, huh? Yeah. So where's your wife? She's at home. I thought you said you didn't have a home. Well, we have a pending divorce and ah. uh, all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's mine. Pending divorce, huh? Is that why you're out driving around instead of at home? Yes, sir. Not bad, huh? Yeah, like I said, it's all gone This was captured on body cam footage, and he had a grand old conversation with the cop who showed up while Tim was waiting to be towed. And of course, Tim Dean was full of S-H-I-T-E. Shite. He would tell the story, you know, to this cop. Hey, listen, I used to be a cop myself. Now I'm a, I'm a driver. Do you know why I'm not a cop anymore? Well, I'm kind of like Batman. I was going up against corruption. I'm like Harvey Dent over here. Used to be a cop. Where were you a cop at? Dumas first and then Sunray. Why'd you quit copping? Well, I pissed off the DA and uh, that happened. I was tackling some pretty big public corruption cases. Ended up with a target on my back and uh, Got arrested by the Texas Rangers on a charge. Pretty big corruption cases. The corruption of a three-year-old child who won't eat her Cheerios. So that encounter, it was kind of weird to the police. It, it kind of weirded out the responding deputy. Ah, uh, if you would stay here, I gotta take some pictures of the vehicle and stuff. Especially since it's insurance, they're gonna want more pictures than right. normal. Is there anything in there I need to know about? Nah. Okay. I've got a, a shotgun in there, but okay. illegal. No drugs or? No, no, no. Stolen guns or anything, right? No. Okay, well, hang tight here. I'll be right back. Keep an eye on him. He's got a firearm on him. I can feel carry. Uh, getting a divorce from Texas, just out driving around. From Texas? Yeah. What hell's he doing here? Well, I thought I'm going to start fucking around the vehicle a little bit. But he forgot about it until a few days later when the investigation into Tim Dean began. See, the investigators into the double homicide, they'd been led to Emporia, started making connections, and that's how they came across this. The deputy then, suddenly being more interested in this character, went to speak with the mechanic who towed Tim's car from where it went up the road. He had some interesting stuff to say. The tow, when I opened it up, it was magazines with ammo and a 
Big magazines or little magazines? Big ones. I, uh, a AR style, like miniature uh, rifle. That's when I saw the shotgun under the tote, grabbed the shotgun, and I saw a, a sport vest. I wouldn't say it was like bulletproof by any means, o'clock. but it Maybe was a, a sport too. shooting vest. And With pouches or something? Um, I don't remember if there's pouches, but it was all black. I'm glad you guys are following up on this because I, I even told him I had weird vibes about all this. They also had a video of him picking up from his rental car body armor and a shotgun. He had been carrying them with him on this drive. So what, what the police at this point were really interested in was, well, in, they were interested in Tim Dean. What was he doing in Kansas? And they were trying to formulate a timeline of where he had been and if he had been driving to New York. So, two days before the murders, he's in Kansas, he's, he's in Kansas, just driving, as he would say to the responding officer when he totaled his rental car. Then he picked up parts of an arsenal he left in that car, he got an Uber, and he went to a motel. And the deputy, you know, who would, who would first encounter Tim Dean on the side of the road, working on like a hunch. He went to a rental car place. Hey, if he rented one car, maybe he would rent another. Well, it turned out Tim Dean tried to rent another. He walked in, and then uh, and then I told him that he couldn't rent because he just had cash on him. And he was really upset about that, and he just left. And reviewing the body cam footage, he said he was going. He literally admitted he was driving to New York. Well, I've got a family friend that I was gonna th gonna go see, but where's that at? That's all the way up in New York. He then, Tim Dean, you know, somehow he got another rental car, even though he was a denied one previously, and then was seen driving towards Sodus, New York. Tim Dean, he was soon taken into custody, and the questions about Amber and Josh began. Is it true you hated Josh? I've never even met the man. Are you sorry Amber and Josh got killed? Do you hear what I'm saying? I hear what you're saying. Are you sorry they got killed? I'm not saying you killed them. Are you sorry Are they, you got sorry they got killed? Can you say their names? Josh and Amber. Say, I'm sorry Josh and Amber got killed. Not that I you did it. That. No, I want, no, you didn't. You're saying I'm it in part. I've never been in the presence of a bigger coward. And the reason he told the police he went to New York in the first place? I was originally going to go see her uncle. And see if I could talk to him and get him to talk some sense into her and maybe get her to ride this thing out with me. I left home with the intention of going somewhere far away and in my head, so no way that knows me would have to be the one to find me and work it. Okay. What changed? And I turned my phone off so nobody could call me and figure out what I was doing and try and talk me out. In the end, nothing. No admittance or anything like that was, was forthcoming from Tim Dean. But they had another person to speak with. Bowler Brown. He's a buddy of mine. Yeah, that's going to cause you more problems than anything. Braun Bowler was a friend of Tim's in Sunray, Texas. He had also worked for the Sunray Police Department. It was his name on Tim's original rental agreement. And so he was on the investigation's radar pretty, pretty quick. Braun readily admitted to renting the car, but he had no idea Tim was planning on using it to go kill people, though. Until he took a polygraph and he failed the polygraph. Braun then told the police about the murder plot. Ron has a decision to make, whether he wants to be a good witness or he wants to be charged in conspiracy to commit two murders. You definitely don't want that. It had been planned in Tim's house. Braun would rent the car in his name, so Tim, you know, it wouldn't be linked to Tim. But then, of course, Tim, like a feck in Egypt, ran it off the road in Kansas, leading to a police report about where he was. Now, Braun, though, he was just helping Tim out of pure friendship. Which is very, very sweet. They all make great cellmates. And they'd be joined by Charlene Childers. See, she had already raised eyebrows. When she said she knew about the murders, and she'd seen them, she'd, she said she'd seen them online. Josh's address in the news that very day, apparently. But that wasn't the case. It hadn't been made public at that point. So something was smelling off. 
There should be no reason for Charlene to be aware of the murders at that point so soon after they happened. She was soon brought in herself. It turned out that after Tim tried to rent a car in Emporia, she herself, and you know, he had been denied, she herself had driven all the way to Kansas to pay for another rental with her credit card. So now he was able to rent another car. That's how he got the car to Sodus. And after a bit of grilling, her goose was cooked. It turned out that during the drive back to Texas from New York, back in August, after the child custody hearing, the one where she said she would divorced him to, to get her kids back. Well, Tim had been with her, and it was during that long ass drive that Charlene suggested something drastic, to which Tim agreed he would do. Charlene, she was the mastermind of the plot, and she told, she told her husband Tim, kill Josh, get the kids back, and life, it'll go back to the way it was. It used, the way life used to be, you know, our perfect Instagrammable life. In the garage of Tim's home, they plotted, and Braun helped them out as, as a good friend uh, would, maybe. The car was rented in his name so Tim would be clear, and then things went to shit in Kansas, but the mission went ahead anyway. Tim, he turned off his phone in Illinois, and then he did what he did. Amber, she wasn't supposed to be killed. She was literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. Two weeks after the killings, Charlene and Tim were charged. When it came to trial, a deal was cut with Charlene, the ringleader, to help in the case against Tim Dean, a case that was already strong. His DNA was found on that ski mask. Charlene cooperated, and in the end, Tim Dean was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder, which was life in prison with no parole. Ron Bowler, he got one to two years for conspiracy. Charlene got 28 years, her earliest release date is 2042. And what a scale, lads, all over the place, tracking these bozos. It's crazy, crazy stuff. Charlene, like for sure, she was a master manipulator and a liar. Tim Dean, he just seems like a pure bollocks. And Braun, just an idiot. But it was a very tragic end for two young, young parents. This story, definitely like up there in the crazy plan tier that was done by pieces of shit. You know, and it was all messed up by trying to do a sweet Yui in the middle of the road. So yeah, great. Big whoop. And now for our second story, and we are diving headfirst into the exciting, unpredictable world of backgammon. Are you familiar? No? Me, me neither. Never played it once in my entire life. Have no desire to, because it looks boring as shit to me. But to one man, it was his life's work. It kind of, kind of, sort of. Let's head to New York City. What, the, what I believe they call the Big Orange. The, the city that's always awake or something like that. And we go to Manhattan's Upper West Side. Ooh la la. And for the date, how about New Year's Eve 2009? On West 68th Street, don't, don't you want to know about how much we're talking here when it comes to apartments? At about 7 a.m., backgammon pro... Rod Kovlin, he called 911 to tell them that his daughter found his wife unconscious in the bath. Rod, he pulled his wife, Shelly, out of the tub, put her face, you know, put her face up on the ground. He started CPR, but alas, to no avail. Paramedics arrived within minutes after the call, but Rod Kovlin's wife, Shelly Danishevsky, she was already gone. Rod Kovlin was inconsolable. When the detectives, they arrived at the scene, they did an examination to see what happened. How did, how did 47-year-old Shelly possibly and probably drown in her own bathtub? Now the tub, it was full of blood, and Shelly was wrapped in a blanket beside the tub. See, above the bath, a cupboard was open, and the door was hanging off his hinge. Somehow, maybe as she was falling, she grabbed the door and fell into the water. But, but why did she fall? Did she slip? And, and crack her head open? And who exactly was Shelly Danishevsky? But who exactly is Roderick Colvin, her husband? Well, Shelly was a very wealthy and successful businesswoman, a wealth manager at Merrill Lynch. So, you know when you're that kind of good old rich when you need to pay somebody to manage your money? Of course, sure don't we all? Run out of mill type stuff over here. So she, well, she was good for a few bob, you know, as they say. She, 
What I mean by that is she was rich with a big old ore. She was fancy, prestigious, well-educated. What you would probably imagine someone who lives uh, on the Upper West Side to be. She was exactly that. And in February 1998, at a Jewish singles mixer, she met... Star of the show, Rod Coughlin. 11 years her junior. Pleased to meet ya. And they hit it off. I mean, how could he... How could they not... When he said he played backgammon. Her drawers done hit the ground. And when I say hit it off, I mean they hit it out of the park. They nearly eloped that very night until Shelly was talked out of it by her sister. You know, maybe eloping with somebody you know for literally just a couple of hours. Not, not a great idea. Romantic, sure, but like, you know, in a romantic movie, this is real life, okay? I'm, and I'm telling you, you know, she, she, I guess she wanted that, that backgammon money. Even though she was rich herself, though. I mean, uh, Rod's job, his day job was a stock trader, and he was fine at it. You know, buy, what, what did I say? Buy high, sell low. That's my motto. Um, or at least that's what, what friggin' keeps happening to me. Six months after they met, they married. Two years later, they had a baby girl, Anna. Shelly got pregnant again, twins this time, but, but sadly it wasn't to be. But in summer 2006, Shelly had a baby boy named Miles. Three years after that, she wound up in a bathtub. At the time, on New Year's Eve, it seems to have been a, a tragic, a tragic accident. An autopsy was decided against a uh, Jewish tradition, not too keen on autopsies or, you know, and you know, the fact that it seemed like an accident, why would you even need to if you were already kind of not we're not a fan of it. Might come back later to that, uh, no spoilers, but as I said, right time, no need for a big investigation or an autopsy. And in the days that followed, conversations between the family and friends turned to the marriage between Rod and Shelley, which was down the toilet. Now Rod, he had a temper like you wouldn't believe. Mood swings, he was cheating on her on the reg. Hey, ladies can't resist the backgammon. He began cheating after Shelley wasn't too keen on the idea of an open marriage. Seems like Rod, he wanted an open marriage, and he was not asking. Rod was also unemployed at the time of Shelley's death. He pretty much just hung out, as I said, obsessed with backgammon. He went to the gym, he practiced a taekwondo so he could taekwondo the shit out of you. A real five-star man. According to his LinkedIn, he, he left his job, been let go, in August 2009 where he worked in algorithmic execution services and dark pool liquidity offerings, which I'm pretty sure is just a bunch of made-up words. He was also founder, chairman, and el presidente of the U.S. Backgammon Federation, where he worked to promote backgammon in the United States. Got your work cut out for you there, Rob. Anyways, it seems the marriage was going to end sooner rather than later when what happened happened. By the time New Year's rolled around, 2009, Rod wasn't actually living with Shelly and the kids anymore. He was miles away on the other side of the hall, literally living rent-free in an apartment Shelly owned in the same building. Nice. Now, Shelly had done this to make it easy for the kids. She was certainly making it easy for Rod, too. Rod, he was moving on. He had started dating someone else. Shelly had begun to also, and a divorce between them Full swing. Then New Year's. Friends and family were suspicious of the story about what happened to Shelley. Rod said Anna, the daughter and oldest child, called him that morning in a panic after finding her mother. She let him in as he did not have a key, and then he pulled her body out of the tub. Yet his clothes remained dry. The medical examiner wrote the cause of death as undetermined. And Shelly, yeah, she didn't really take baths. She was a shower gal. She'd also gotten her hair uh, keratin treated the day before. Dunno, you know, I mean, when you get that done, you're not supposed to get your hair wet. Although, I mean, then again, you're also kind of less likely to get your hair wet in a bathtub. But she had bruising on her lip, scratch marks, and bruises on her hand. So what really happened? The doorman also thought it was weird that early that morning, Rod popped out to get some candy, and he gave one to the doorman. And Rod wasn't the chatty type who would normally do something quite like that. So the police were thinking, well, whoever smelt it, dealt it. But an autopsy would have revealed more if, you know, they had been able to do one. Police kind of had their, their hands tied at this point. 
The family, however, pressed for more and hired a private investigator. They learned the marriage was more turbulent than they thought. Rod had even tried to get Shelley fired from her job. He was also draining their joint bank account and they fought over child support. And a judge had even told Rod he couldn't play backgammon anymore. He was so obsessed with it. Which? Whoa, 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 whoa. Judge, come on. Let's not take something we can't take back here. Rod, he had started tracking Shelley's location, hacking into her emails and reading them. And on the night before she died, she was walking home and she, she just happened to run into a friend on the street. Shelley told this friend she thought she was being followed. When the family of Shelley took the private eye to Shelley's apartment, he noticed that the cupboard she may or may not have grabbed as she fell, the screws were taken out of the wall, which would have taken a lot more effort than Shelley, a daintyish woman, could have mustered. Can I hear you say staged? This was enough for the family to decide to have her exhumed, which they did two months after her death. The police were then back on the scene, and the medical examiner could now positively say a neck bone was broken. Shelley had been choked to death. This was now a homicide. By 2012, Rod was living with his parents in a New York City suburb, and Rod's parents were now the legal guardians of the kids, and Shelley's family, well, they knew something was up. Now, Rod's parents were the legal guardians rather than Rod himself because Rod, well, piece of shit. And so this meant that Rod couldn't get their money, Shelley's money, as he was a suspect. Everything Shelley owned went to her kids as she was getting a divorce from Rod. And Rod, he didn't seem to get along too well with, with his own parents, though. As we know, Rod he had quite the temper. Sometimes he would even physically fight his dad. Because you steal from your children. What? You stole before. <laughs> You're stealing their college money. They won't be able to get one of college money to find your job with them. And you said you didn't care if they went to college. Why don't you tell Anna that every penny you're spending right now is her money and Miles' money? That's Shelly. Wait, wait. Oh, hold on a second, Anna. I'd like you to come here. Hold on a second. Come here, please. Yeah. Because you come, haven't come worked five come years in the 12 Ma, years you were married, you, you, never, talking? you never worked. You ne your mother worked her ass off for every penny that he's spending. Let me tell you, the Danishevskis are not wrong. They may be wrong about something, not the money. Okay. Yes, you, what you're saying you now, what you, are, what you are saying now in front of Anna and Miles, okay, will ensure that you never see my children again if you continue, okay? You threatened us with no, your children. No, no, I'm not okay, threatening you. Know I'm telling I want you, you out excuse of the house me. By October first. Okay, evict me. Evict me. You evict know what, me. Anna? Excuse me. I spent a million dollars of my money to make sure you didn't go to the Danish ships. No. One time, they even locked him out of the house while keeping him away from the children. This didn't. Uh, Rod, he wasn't too keen on it. I have to say it to be honest. And so, when Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012, he hatched a plan. To to uh, get into the house, his parents' house, when the power would be out due to the hurricane, no alarms would be active, he would sneak in, murder his parents, and then set the house on fire. Then he would be the legal guardian of his own children, and he could get all their assets as their legal guardian. Uh, another idea he had was to get his own daughter, Anna, to put rat poison in uh, his parents' tea. And then, because Shelley's money went to the kids, not to him, and with all this going on, Rod Parents, now the legal guardians, he had another bright idea. And this is the third one, folks. He plotted to kidnap his own daughter, Anna, take her to Mexico. There, he would pay someone $10,000 to marry her with a prenup in order to emancipate her from her grandparents. That plan never came to pass, but boy oh boy, was it a winner. He was always scheming to get his kids back and regain access to their inheritance. Rod's final plan to get rid of his parents and get his kids back was to, get this, kill his mother by breaking her neck while disguised as a, quote, black man who was going door to door during the election in 2012. He even drove to a costume store where he bought a mustache, a black man wig, and black man makeup, according to the court documents. On election day, he allegedly planned to ring his mother's bell while in, I mean, blackface, I guess, and then karate chop her in the throat to kill her. 
That's all quoted, by the way. These are not my words. These are the court documents words. But thankfully, a girlfriend talked him out of it. Kind of would have been curious to see if she hadn't talked him out of it, what would have happened. See, things were beginning to not look like an accident as it was intended to look. And in fact, an email was found in the drafts folder of his daughter Anna's account in 2013. That email made for interesting reading. Quote, All these years, I have been so incredibly afraid and guilty about the night my mom died. I lied. She didn't just slip. That day, we got into a fight about her dating, and I was still mad when I went to bed. I heard her go into a room and run a bath. So I went in and argued some more, and she told me to go back to my room. And I got so mad, I pushed her. But it couldn't have been that hard. I didn't mean to hurt her, I swear. But she fell, and I heard a terrible noise, and the water started turning red. And I tried to pull her head up, but she remained still. So I took Miles, crawled into her bed, and cried myself back to sleep, hoping I would wake up to see her right next to me. But when I woke up, she wasn't. So I called Daddy, and he tried CPR and all sorts of stuff like that. But it didn't work. At which point he called the police, and you know it from there. Interesting. Well... Remember, Rod was hacking into his wife's emails, so yeah, his daughter's too. Framing your kid. No one bought that for a second. It would take six years, true, slowly gathering evidence, an ex-girlfriend told uh, the police about his schemes, before Rod Kovlin would be charged with murder in 2015. He was arrested at a train station in Scarsdale, New York. His trial wouldn't be in until 2019, however. The prosecution said he wanted her money, the kids, and her out of there. Then, he decided, you know, I'll cut my losses. How about just the money, not so much the kids? The nanny took the stand and told a story. A girlfriend took the stand and told a story. At one point, Rod had even taken their son Miles to the hospital, saying Shelley had been sexually abusing him. That's, I mean, he'd been trying to get her fired too, so he was trying to destroy her life. See, when Rod was broke, backgammon, I'll leave you on the street, and even though they were getting uh, divorced, well, if something happened to her, Rod, he might nab her $5 million estate. However, two days before her death, she'd written to a lawyer about changing her will and leaving Rod out of everything, which the prosecution said, well, when Rod learned of this, he snapped. But despite all of this, there was not much evidence that Rod had actually killed Shelley. He said his daughter let him in, which was a lie. He had his own key to that apartment. But there was no signs of a struggle, so what really happened? The broken bone in the neck, which the police said was evidence of a homicide, well, the defense said that could have been done during the exhumation. In fact, Rod's parents, who he had almost murdered a couple of times, they still thought Shelley Danishevsky's death was an accident. Couldn't be, my boy. He's an angel. The investigation was poor. No DNA taken. No dusting for fingerprints. Everybody initially thought it was an accidental death. They didn't secure items in the bathroom. For evidence, they took no notes, only spoke to a couple of neighbors. They never searched Rod's apartment. They also allowed the family's rabbi to clean the bathroom, the place of death, with peroxide, eliminating any evidence of blood, any evidence of anything, really. After an eight-week trial, it was up to the jury to decide if this had been a tragic accident or murder. After a day of deliberations, Rod was found guilty. 25 years to life for the murder of Shelley Danishevsky. It's an interesting case in that the evidence he committed the act itself was largely circumstantial. He must have let himself in early in the morning, taekwondoed her till her neck broke, then filled the tub and left. And we leave Rod in prison, where he remains to this day. And I mean, come on, there's more than enough evidence that he was a shitty person. That sound kind of seemed like something he would do, from plotting to kill his own parents during a hurricane, to plotting his daughter to poison them, to plotting to kill them in blackface. It's... I mean, he's a real piece of shit, and also kind of a racist, so he sucks all round. I think the lesson you gotta learn here, folks, is, once again, don't let backgammon go to your head. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this old podcast. It really means the world to me. I'm having so much fun making these podcasts, so I hope you're having fun listening to them. And yeah, listen, uh, remember new podcast every Monday, new podcast every Friday with a new video every Tuesday. So check them out and I will talk to you real soon in the next old one. But till then, 
Please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out.